Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the first six months of 2024 Novo Nordisk AS Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there'll be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 and 1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 and 1 again. Please be advised that today's conference has been recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your first speaker today, Jakob Gorda, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Welcome to this Novo Nordisk earnings call for the first six months of 2024. My name is Jakob Martin Viborod, and I'm the Head of Investor Relations at Novo Nordisk. With me today, I have CEO of Novo Nordisk, Lars Forgård Jørgensen, Executive Vice President and Head of Commercial Strategy and Corporate Affairs, Camilla Sudvest, Executive Vice President and Head of North America Operations, Doc Langer, Executive Vice President and Head of Development, Martin Holtz Lange, and finally, Chief Financial Officer, Carsten Munk Knudsen. All speakers will be available for the Q&A session. Today's announcement and the slides for this call are available on our, on our website, nomenordis.com. Please note that this call is being webcasted live and a recording will be made available on our website as well. The call is scheduled to last one hour. Please turn to the next slide. The presentation is structured as outlined, as outlined on slide two. Please note that all sales and operating profit growth statements will be at constant exchange rates unless otherwise specified. Please turn to the next slide. We need to advise you that this call will contain forward-looking statements. These are subject to risk and uncertainty that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations. For further information on the risk factors, please see the company announcement for the first six months of 2024, as well as the slides prepared for this presentation. With that, over to you, Lars, for an update on our strategic aspirations. Thank you, Jarob. Please turn to next slide. In the first six months, we delivered 25% sales growth and 19% operating profit growth both at constant exchange rates. The operating profit growth was impacted by the impairment loss related to Osudurinon. We'd like to start this call by going through the performance highlights across our strategic aspirations before handing over the word to my colleagues. Starting with our focus on purpose and sustainability, we are now serving more than 42 million patients with our diabetes and obesity treatments. Our total carbon emissions rose by 31%, as compared to the first six months of 2023. This was primarily driven by our increased investments in capital expenditure to meet the high demand for our products. To uphold our commitment to being a sustainable employer, we expanded the number of women in senior leadership positions to 41%, compared to 40% in the first six months of 2023. Across all leadership positions, 46% are held by women. Within R&D, we had a number of exciting readouts this quarter, including the positive MyMate Phase 3 results. Martin will come back to this and our overall R&D milestones later. The quarterly sales growth reflects solid commercial execution across both our rating units. The performance in the first six months has enabled us to raise our outlook for the full year. Camilla and Doug will go through the details later. Carsten will go through the financials, but I'm very pleased with our performance in the first six months of 2024. With that, I'll give the word to Camilla for an update on commercial execution. Thank you, Lars, and please turn to the next slide. In the first six months of 2024, our total sales increased by 25% at constant exchange rates. The sales growth was driven by both operating units with North America operations growing 36% and international operations growing 11%. In the U.S., sales growth was positively impacted by gross-to-net sales adjustments related to prior years. Our GLP-1 sales increased in diabetes by 32%, driven by North America operations growing 39%, and international operations growing 20%. Insulin sales increased by 10%, driven by North America operations growing 36%, and international operations growing 3%. Obesity care sales increased 37%, driven by North America growing 35%, and international operations growing 47%. In international operations, we continue to roll out Vigovi gradually with volume cap launches to balance supply and demand. In both geographies, growth was driven by Vigovi, partly offset by declining Saxenda sales as the market is moving towards once-weekly treatments. Where disease sales decreased by 3%. Please turn to the next slide. 
With 25% sales growth in diabetes care, we are growing faster than the total diabetes market. As a result, our global diabetes value market share increased to 34.1%. This is above uh, our strategic aspiration of reaching one-third of the global diabetes value market in 2025. The increase reflects market share gains in both North America operations and international operations. Please turn to the next slide. In international operations, diabetes care sales increased by 11% in the first six months of 2024, which was primarily driven by TLP1 sales growing 20%. Novo Nordisk is the market leader in international operations with a TLP1 value market share of 69%. Ozempic continues its TLP1 market leadership with 46.6% market share. We are also pleased to see Rebeltus increasing its market share to more than 16%, driven by solid uptake across across geographies. And with that, I will hand over to Doc. Thank you, Camilla. Please turn to the next slide. Sales in North America is driven by market share gains and healthy prescription volume growth of the GLP-1 class above 10% in the second quarter this year compared to the second quarter last year. Sales of GLP-1 diabetes care products in the U.S. increased by 42% at constant exchange rates. The sales increase was mainly driven by continued uptake of Ozempic. Measured on total prescriptions, Novo Nordisk expands its market leadership, now with around 56% market share. Note that the sales growth of Ozempic was negatively impacted by periodic supply constraints in the beginning of the year. Please go to the next slide. To safeguard continuity of care for Wagovi, we reduced the supply of the lower dose strengths in May of 2023, which continued throughout the remainder of last year. In the beginning of this year, we gradually started increasing the supply of the lower dose strengths, and I am pleased to see that this has been reflected in prescriptions, and we are now seeing more than double the number of prescriptions in the market compared to the beginning of the year. Further, while demand is still expected to exceed supply, we grow more confident in our ability to supply. We will continue to dynamically manage supply, but only the initiation dose strength of 0.25 milligrams. Wagovi still has broad market access with coverage for more than 50 million people with obesity. And importantly, around 10 million vulnerable people with obesity now have access to Wagovi through channels such as Medicaid, which is now available in more than 20 states. Ultimately, our focus is to reach more patients living with obesity. And as volumes go up, prices will come down. In the first six months of 2024, sales growth was driven by increased volumes, partially countered by lower realized prices. Next slide, please. Our rare disease sales decreased by 3%. Sales in international operations declined by 14%. This was partly offset by a 13% sales increase in North America operations, reflecting the Segroya launch and positive gross to net adjustments related to prior years in the U.S. Rare blood disorder sales decreased by 2%, driven by lower Novo 7 and hemophilia A sales. This was part, partially countered by increased hemophilia B sales. Rare endocrine disorder sales decreased by 8%. We are working on reestablishing full supply capacity of rare endocrine disorder products following a reduction of manufacturing output. Now over to you, Martin, for an update on R&D. Thank you, Doc. Please turn to the next slide. I'm very pleased to share the results of the Frontier 2 Phase 3 trial with my mate, which we provided headline results for back in May. The full data set was also disclosed at the ISTH in June. Before I walk you through the results, I would like to briefly remind you of the innovative clinical trial design. Frontier 2 was a pivotal Phase 3 26-week open-label, randomized, controlled, and multi-arm trial. The trial investigated the efficacy and safety of once-weekly and once-monthly subcutaneous mimate versus no previous prophylaxis treatment um, or on-demand treatment and versus prior co coagulation factor prophylaxis treatment. 254 people aged 12 years and older with hemophilia A with or without inhibitors were included in the trial. The co-primary endpoint was mean annualized bleeding rate for treated bleeds for both once weekly and once monthly mimate versus on-demand treatment and versus prior coagulation factor, uh, factor prophylaxis treatment. 
Please turn to the next slide. Overall in Frontier 2, MyMed demonstrated superiority of MyMed prophylaxis with both weekly and monthly doses. In the on-demand treatment population, MyMed demonstrated superior reductions of 97 and 99 percent in estimated mean annualized bleeding rate for once weekly and once monthly treatment respectively. This was compared to those receiving continued on-demand treatment. In the intrapatient comparison, in people with prior coagulation factor prophylaxis, MyMen demonstrated superior reductions of 48 and 43 percent in estimated mean annual bleeding rates uh, for once weekly and once monthly treatment respectively. Of note, in the population with prior on-demand treatment, 86 and 95 percent of people receiving once weekly and once monthly MyMed treatment respectively experience zero treated bleeds. In the population with prior coagulation factor prophylaxis, 66% and 65% of people receiving once weekly and once monthly MyMate respect, uh, respectively had zero bleeds. In the trial, MyMate appeared to have a safe and well-tolerated profile with no thromboembolic events observed and no evidence of neutralizing anti-MyMate antibodies. Further, only 5 to 10, uh, sorry, 5 to 12 percent of patients experience uh, injection site reactions across all five treatment arms. In conclusion, we are very excited about the Frontier 2 results. Given the differ, uh, differing needs of people living with hemophilia AA at once weekly or at once monthly dosing provides optionality and flexibility for people living with hemophilia AA with and without inhibitors. We now expect to file for first regulatory approval of MyMate during the first half of 2025. Next slide, please. Turning to diabetes, I would also like to share the results from the Combined One trial, which investigated the use of once-weekly Icosema, a combination of once-weekly insulin icodec and once-weekly once semaglutide in people with type 2 diabetes. The objective of the 52-week trial was to assess the efficacy and safety of switching to once-weekly icosema compared to once-weekly insulin icodec alone in people with type 2 diabetes inadequately controlled on a daily basal insulin with or without oral anti-diabetic drugs. The trial achieved its primary endpoint with icosema demonstrating superiority in reducing A1C at week 52 with once-weekly icosema compared with insulin icodec. From an overall HbA1c baseline of 8.2%, Icosema achieved an estimated reduction in A1c of 1.6 percentage points compared to 0.9 percentage points for insulin IVDEC. People in the trial had a baseline body weight of 48, um, sorry, 84.5 kilograms. Treatment with Icosema achieved a superior change in body weight with a weight loss of 3.7 kilograms compared with a 1.9 kilograms weight gain with insulin icodec. The estimated treatment difference was 5.6 kilograms. In the trial, the rate of clinically significant or severe hypoglycemia was statistically significantly lower with Icosema at 0.14 events per patient years of exposure versus 0.63 events per patient year of exposure with once-weekly insulin icodec. In the trial, once-weekly icosema appeared to have a safe and well-tolerated profile. Now that the third and last pivotal phase 3 trial is completed, we expect to file for regulatory approval of icosema during the second half of 2024. Next slide, please. Now I would like to highlight some of the additional exciting R&D news, including trial readouts and initiations anticipated for the rest of the year. Within diabetes, insulin icodec under the brand name of a weekly has been approved in multiple countries. In the US, however, we are disappointed to have received a complete response letter from the FDA for insulin icodec. The letter outlined requests related to the manufacturing process and the type two, sorry, the type one diabetes indication 
before the application review could be completed. We're evaluating the content of the CRL and will work closely with the FDA to fulfill the requests. We do not expect to be able to fulfill the request during 2024. In the first half of this year, the flow data were submitted as a label exp uh, expansion application to the FDA in the US and to the European regulatory authorities. Submissions to regulatory authorities in Japan and China are expected in the second half of 2024. Additionally, in the second half of this year, we are expected to see the readout of the stride outcome trial with Ocempic 1.0 milligram in peripheral artery disease. Further, we also expect readout of the sole cardiovascular outcome trial with the Rebelsus 14 milligram. Both trials are expected to further strengthen the comprehensive cardiometabolic evidence that we have for semaglutide. Also in the second half of the year, we look forward to initiate a phase two study for amicretin, demonstrating our commitment to continuously raising the innovation behind diabetes. Moving to obesity care, in the second quarter, we successfully completed the OASIS-4 trial. OASIS-4 investigated once, week, once daily semaglutide 25 milligram for weight management in adults with obesity or overweight with one or more comorbidities. The trial achieved its primary endpoint with oral semaglutide 25 milligram, demonstrating superiority compared to placebo with respect to change in body weight. From a baseline body weight of 105.9 kilograms, oral semaglutide 25 milligram achieved a 13.6% reduction compared to 2.2% reduction with placebo. The global launch of oral semaglutide 25 milligram is contingent on portfolio prioritization and manufacturing capacity. For we go, we received regulatory approval for the treatment of obesity or overweight in China. And in the EU, the EMA adopted a positive opinion for an update of the WIGOE label to reflect data from the SELECT trial. The SELECT cardiovascular outcome trial demonstrated that WIGOE statistically significantly, uh, significantly reduced the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events by 20% compared to placebo. The label update will also include SELECT data showing a numerical risk reduction in cardiovascular death by 15%, a significant risk reduction of death from any cause by 19%, as well as a significant risk reduction of 18% in heart failure composite endpoints. Last for Vigoe, based on interactions with the FDA, we decided to withdraw the results from the step have pef trials for regulatory review in the US and EU to further substantiate the likelihood of getting heart endpoints into the label update. We now expect to resubmit the file in the beginning of 2025 with additional relevant data. We, may, we remain excited about the potential of semaglutide 2.4 milligram in this population, given the data that we've seen from the two completed step head pet trials. Looking ahead, we are in the second half expecting phase two trial, uh, results for uh, Mondunaband, as well as phase three results for the step up trial with semaglutide 7.2 uh, uh, milligram around the turn of the year. Lastly, we anticipate first phase three results for, uh, for redefined one with cacrosema in obesity. With all of this activity, we're confident with the progress, uh, progress we're making towards developing superior treatment solutions for people with obesity. Within cardiovascular and emerging therapy areas, we, in June 2024, announced that the Clarion CKD phase three trial involving osiduronone was terminated. This was based on an interim analysis performed by an independent monitoring committee that concluded that the trial met the pre-specified futility criteria, meaning that the trial unfortunately did not uh, meet its primary endpoint. We've initiated a randomized and placebo-controlled phase three trial, uh, cardiovascular outcomes trial called the ARTMIS. The trial will assess the efficacy and safety of siltivegamib 15 milligram in a mute, uh, acute myocardial infarction. Lastly, we look much forward to the phase three readout of the ESSENCE trial, investigating semaglutide 2.4 milligram in MASH. With that, over to you, Carsten. Thank you, Martin. Please turn to the next slide. 
In the first six months of 2024, our sales grew by 24% in Danish kroner and 25% at constant exchange rates, driven by both operating units. In the U.S., sales growth was positively impacted by growth to net sales adjustments related to prior years. The gross margin decreased to 84.9% compared to 85.1% in 2023. The decline is mainly driven by increased costs related to ongoing capacity expansions. This is partially countered by a positive price impact from gross to net adjustments related to prior years in the U.S., in addition to positive product mix reflecting increased sales of GLP-1-based treatments. Sales and distribution costs increased by 5% in Danish kroner and by 6% at constant exchange rates. The increase in sales and distribution costs is impacted by adjustments to legal provisions in the second quarter of 2023. In North America operations, the cost increase is mainly driven by promotional activities related to Wigovi, while in international operations, the increase is mainly related to promotional activities for Rebelsus, as well as obesity care market development activities. Research and development costs increased by 79% measured in Danish kroner and by 78% at constant exchange rates. The increase in cost is mainly driven by increased late state clinical trial activity and increased early research activities, as well as the impairment related to osiduronon of 5.7 billion Danish kroner and other impairments of intangible assets. Administration costs increased by 8% measured both in Danish kroner and constant exchange rates. Operating profit increased by 18% measured in Danish kroner and by 19% at constant exchange rates. Operating profit is impacted by the impairment loss related to osiduronon of 5.7 billion Danish kroner. Net financial items showed an, a net loss of 530 million Danish kroner compared to a net gain of 96 million Danish kroner last year, mainly reflecting hedging losses on the US dollar. The effective tax rate was 20.6% in the first six months of 2024, compared to 19.9% in the first six months of 2023. Net profit increased by 16% and diluted earnings per share increased by 17% to 10 kroner and 17 euro. Net profit is negatively impacted by the 5.7 billion Danish kroner impairment of Osiduronan. Free cash flow realized in first half of 2024 was 41.3 billion Danish kroner compared to 45.5 billion in the first six months of 2023. The lower free cash flow reflects increasing capital expenditure as well as acquisition of intangible assets. This is partially countered by net cash generated from operating X. The impairment of the intangible asset or the duranon of 5.7 billion Danish kroner has no impact on free cash flow. Capital expenditure for property, plant and equipment was 18.9 billion Danish kroner compared to 10.6 billion Danish kroner in 2023. This was primarily driven by investments in additional capacity for API production and fill finish capacity for both current and future injectable and oil products. Please go to the next slide. A key priority for Nunorsk is to ensure attractive allocation of capital to shareholders. For 2023, the total dividend per share increased uh, 51.6% to 9 uh, kroner and 40 euro. For 2024, the board of directors has decided to pay out an interim dividend of 3 kroner and 50 euro per share, which will be paid out in August of this year. We have returned more than 38 billion Danish kroner to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks in the first six months of 2024. Our ongoing repurchase program for the full year amounts to up to 20 billion Danish kroner, a reduction from 30 billion Danish kroner allocated last year. This allocation aligns with our strategic capital allocation strategy for Nunorsk. We prioritize investing in internal growth opportunities, returning capital to shareholders through dividends, and business development activities. Finally, we look towards share buyback program as a flexible measure contingent on the first three priorities to distribute excess cash. We continued the growth momentum in 2024 and have raised our sales growth outlook to between 22 and 28% at constant exchange rates. 
The updated sales outlook at constant exchange rates reflects higher fully expectations for both operating units. The guidance reflects expectations for sales growth in both North America operations and international operations, mainly driven by volume growth of GLP-1-based treatments for obesity and diabetes care. With the expectation of continued volume growth and capacity limitations at some manufacturing sites, the outlook also reflects expected continued periodic supply constraints and related drug shortage notifications a number, across a number of products and geographies. Nordisk is investing in internal and external capacity to increase supply both short and long term. Operating profit growth outlook is now expected to be between 20 and 28 percent at constant exchange rates. The updated expectation reflects the impairment loss reflected to us during communicated in June of negative six percentage points. Excluding this impact, we now expect a positive four percentage point increase on operating profit growth expectations for the full year. This is driven by the updated increased sales outlook compared to previous expectations. Capital expenditure is still expected to be around 45 billion Danish kroner in 2024, reflecting expansion of the global supply chain. Free cash flow is now expected to be between 59 and 69 billion Danish kroner, reflecting the sales growth, a favorable impact from rebates in the U.S. countered by investments in capital expenditure. The updated cash flow expectation mainly reflects the increased sales growth outlook. Income under the 340B program has been partially recognized. One ruling from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit remains pending, and along with the D.C. Circuit ruling may be subject to further discretionary appellate review before the U.S. Supreme Court. Depending on the outcome of any subsequent rulings and appeals in these matters, there may be a material impact on the North financial position, net sales, and cash flow. Financial impacts related to and following the expected closing of the Catalan transaction have not been included in the financial guidance. That covers the outlook for 2024. Now back to you, Lars. Thank you, Carsten. Please turn to the final slides. We are very pleased with the sales growth in the first six months of 2024. The growth is driven by increasing demand for our gl based diabetes and obesity treatments, and we're serving more patients than ever before. Within R&D, we are very pleased with the first phase three trial results with MyMate and its potential for people living with hemophilia, as well as the recommendation for label ex extension for cardiovascular risk reduction for Wegovy in the EU. With, like, with that, I'd like to hand over the word to Jakob. Thank you, Lars. Next slide, please. With that, we're now ready for the Q&A, where I kindly ask all participants to limit her or himself to one or maximum two questions, including sub-questions. Operator, we're now ready to take the first question. Thank you. Once again, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 and 1 again. We will now take your first question. And your first question comes from the line of Emily Field from Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions. I'll ask one on Wagobi pricing and one on Wagobi supply. The first question on pricing, um, in terms of the growth to net in the U.S. widening um, from 1Q to 2Q, can you help us understand the moving parts here? Is there a component of seasonality, how much due to competition, or how much due to channel mix, as you talked about more penetrating into the Medicaid channel, and you can now sell to the select population in Medicare? And then secondly, on supply, it's great to see the 0.5 and 1 meg doses of Wagobi coming off the FDA drug shortage list. Although it does seem like you're voluntarily keeping the 0.25 dosage capped in order to limit new patients, do you expect this cap to continue throughout the rest of the year, or could it be lifted before the end of 2024? Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for those two questions. For the first question, I'll hand it over to Lars on overall pricing dynamics before turning uh, to Doc on, on U.S.-specific dynamics pricing-wise and also on the supply situation. Lars? Yeah, thank you, uh, Emily, and thank you, Jarb. So I would say overall, uh, the current market uh, structure is one where we really uh, compete and secure success based on ability to supply. So it's, it's not it's not one where, uh, say, classical commercial tactics uh, is is dominating. And you should see uh, our say our commercial strategies in that perspective. Um, 
you allude to the channel mix, and uh, we also just had in our briefs that we are now uh, expanding access in, in Medicaid. So we have 20 states uh, adopting Wegovi in Medicaid. And of course, with that expansion, as we know from all drug categories, when you move into to some of these channels, it comes at a lower, say, net price in these channels, uh, which then has no all uh, impact. But I would say uh, we, uh, we are encouraged with, say, a stable competitive dynamics, and our focus is really on, on uh, securing uh, supply to make sure that we can uh, serve as many patients as possible more than other, say, uh, tougher com commercial tactics. Thank you, Lars. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Doc, on, on, on the U.S. specifics as well as on the supply situation. Yeah, thanks, Lars, and thanks for the question, Emily. So overall, I'd start with, you know, we're pleased with the Wagovi performance, whether you look at the MBRX moving from roughly 5,000 new branded prescriptions at the beginning of the year to, to 35 currently, or the TRX, which moved from 100,000 at the beginning of the year to roughly 200,000 or doubling. We're pleased with that. We're serving more patients than ever before, as Lars mentioned earlier. And market access continues to be robust. As I had mentioned, there's over 50 million people with obesity and importantly, around 10 million vulnerable patients that have access via Medicaid in around 20 states. So that's robust and we're, we're pleased with that. Um, and, and in doing that, we're seeing that almost or above 80% of the patients are paying $25 or less. And, and that is our ambition. Our, gro our goal is to grow market access. And it's fair to assume as volume goes up, prices will come down. And we have seen lower Wagovi prices in the first half. I don't want to get into specifics there, but it is in line with expectations. Um, our focus remains in building even stronger access for AOM treatments across all channels. And again, I'd, I'd say that we are pleased with the overall performance and we're serving more patients than ever before. Thank you so much, Doc. And finally, also on the, uh, on the lower dose strengths of Wegovy and the update there. Yeah, and so uh, we, we, we don't believe that the 0.25, that was, a, that was a choice we made. Again, as we've said consistently quarter after quarter, continuity of care is incredibly important to us and maybe what separates us. You know, we, we think it's really important that patients are able to titrate through the appropriate doses. So we'll continue to dynamically manage that, but we're also confident in the levels that we see with all the other dose strengths. So uh, you shouldn't anticipate that 0.25 changing uh, throughout this year to the question. Thank you, Doc, and thank you, Emily. We are now ready to take the next question, please. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Louise Chen from Cantor. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my questions here. So first one I had was just on Manunaband. Wanted to see what type of efficacy and safety you expect to see or want to see to move forward with this product. And then second question was just on Essence. Out of the 1,200 patients enrolled in this phase three study, how many patients are expected to be part of the F2, F3 biopsy readout? Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for those two questions. Uh, I'll hand both of them to you, Martin, first on Malunaband expectations as well as on patients enrolled in Essence. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we uh, continue to be excited about the potential for Malunaband. Uh, uh, we, we don't have a lot of news yet. We expect the readout uh, from the dedicated obesity trial in Q3 of this year and from the diabetes uh, kidney disease trial um, at the end of this year. Uh, based on our modeling, we, we, we expect around a 15% uh, weight loss, um, and obviously our focus is on demonstrating that together with an attractive safety profile. But we don't have a lot of news uh, at this point. You have to wait a, a couple of months before that. Um, on, on the essence trial, you, you'll probably recall we, we, we sort of have a two-tier two trial. The first proportion of the trial includes 800 patients which will serve as the regulatory submission. Um, we'll see the readout of those 800 patients this year. They will all have uh, liver biopsies and they will be in the F2 to F3 category. Uh, we, we then go to the full 1,200 patients for a heart incomes, uh, outcomes uh, proportion of the trial. It will basically also be patients who have uh, liver biopsies and be in the F2 to, to F3 categories. But first step is to see the regulatory readout, uh, which we will receive at the end, towards the end of the year. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Luis. We are now ready to take the next question, please. Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the line of Evan Feigerman from BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for taking my questions and for all of the color on the call today. Um, one, um, a few from me, just on the Catalan transaction, maybe you just walk us through kind of the update there. And more specifically, as you think about building out um, capacity, what other levers can you pull to kind of get your supply of incretins up to meet demand? I know that was a key theme on the call today. And then maybe you kind of walk us through some of the expectations for the um, um, CB1 inverse agonist um, data that's coming um, later in the third quarter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Evan, for those two questions. Firstly, to, to Carsten on Catalan and overall supply chain, chain strategy. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Evan, for, for this question, and, and, and good, to, good to connect. Uh, so so on, on Catalan, it is still our expectation that, uh, that the transaction closes uh, uh, towards the end of uh, 2024. Uh, we're, we're in active dialogue uh, with, with the different regulators uh, in terms of uh, antitrust reviews. Uh, so, but but, but uh, reiterate uh, closing towards uh, the end of the year. Uh, and with Catalan, we are we're significantly expanding our our fill finish uh, network with uh, with the three additional sites on top of the sites we already have have up and running. And uh, by the way, also are expanding. So, so our all all supply chain strategy is is really one of of scaling our API uh, facilities in in Kalumborg. Uh, uh, on, on the peptide side and, and in Hilo, Denmark, on, on the antibody side, uh, linked to our pipeline progression, and then scaling our fill finish sites on, on, on a global scale to be able to accommodate uh, significantly many more patients uh, than, than we've been able to, to do so historically. And that ties into our whole corporate strategy of uh, being able to reach many, many more uh, patients uh, than, than we've ever done before, linked to the unmet need in the cardiometabolic space. Thank you, Carsten. And secondly, on Moluna band expectations again for Martin. Yeah, so, so, so again, not a lot of news. Uh, we're expecting two data readouts, uh, one from obesity, one from diabetes uh, later th this year. That will be exciting. Our focus will obviously be on the efficacy in terms of the weight loss. Our current modeling is suggesting at least a 15% um, uh, weight loss, that will be an attractive uh, oral uh, monotherapy in and of itself, but also with the potential of, of being combined with some side. But these are early days, these are modern data, and, and we'll see the stronger readouts uh, in, 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 in Q3 and Q4 of this year. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Evan. We are ready to take the next question, please. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Sachin Jane from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, I'll take my questions too, please. Uh, firstly, a big picture one for Carsten, just on guidance. Uh, midpoint, I believe, implies underlying acceleration in 2H relative to the underlying growth in first half. Uh, given there's a lot of moving parts, I wonder if you could just talk through some of the key drivers, pushes and pulls, particularly around Wigovi and Azempic. And then the second uh, question is to try and get a bit more color, uh, Doug, Carsten, Lars, on the Wigovi price um, around the commentary of as volumes go up, price comes down. If you would give us some sense of magnitude of price pressure short and midterm. So I'm going to frame the question like this. You've loosely commented to around 10% price pressure per year for a Zempic. Should we think about Wigovi as more or less than that? And can you give any specific color on 2H trends relative to 1H? Thank you. Thank you, Satching. For the first one on guidance building blocks, I'll hand that to you, Carsten. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that uh, question, Satchin. And, and as noted in, in our release, uh, then, then, then we are upgrading our top line guidance uh, uh, by a couple of uh, points and, uh, and narrowing the guidance range also, so, so, so really supporting the fact that, that we are off to a, to a really strong start uh, in, uh, in this year and, and see strong trends both commercially as, as, as well as uh, supply chain wise, so that's the backdrop for for our increasing in guidance, and and then to to the second half uh, acceleration part of your question, yes, that that is correct, and uh, you could say the 25% growth we have in in the first half of this year benefits from uh, uh, from the rebate adjustments we, we've been talking to related to the U.S. both in the first quarter and in the second quarter as well as to an easier comparator linked link to the phasing of rebates in 2023. 
So, so we delivered a 25% uh, uh, with uh, both a tailwind and an easy comparator, and then delivering that for the full year clearly entails an acceleration in, into the second half in, in terms of growth, despite the fact that the comparator is, is tougher uh, linked to the rebate facing of, uh, of, of last year. And that acceleration is, is, is really a function of, of continued trends of, of what you're seeing already in the marketplace today in, in terms of the Vigovi penetration in, in the U.S., where we doubled the number of scripts from the beginning of the year until, uh, until now, uh, weekly scripts. Also an acceleration in terms of Vigovi sales in, in international operations and, uh, and a continuation of, uh, of Ozempic performance in, into the second half. So, so underlying clearly an acceleration uh, during the second half compared to the first half. Thank you, Carsten. And secondly, on overall pricing dynamics, Lars? Yeah, so thank you, Sachin. So we would we prefer not to get into very detailed comments on pricing because that that turns into say a, a quarter or a quarter uh, storyline. Then, so but I, but I, I would like to to uh, say underline what I mentioned in in my opening that, and also as Carsten just alluded to, this is a this is a, a marketplace where we compete on on bringing uh, say volumes to the market. So it's not one where uh, we feel that. Uh, we are into, say, price competition. Having said that, there are different uh, segments uh, of the market, and uh, we feel that it's it, it's uh, relevant to also be present in the segments where we have the most vulnerable patients, and they are typically uh, served by, by Medicaid. So we have uh, now, as we mentioned, 20 states uh, having adopted Bigovi, and uh, we all know that for for any product, when you when you go into Medicaid, it comes at a somewhat uh, lower price point, so that should be factored in. So it's it's uh, it's a stable competitive uh, setting, and it's really for us about uh, scaling the volumes to deliver on on the demand. Uh, sorry, on on the on the access we have delivered, uh, and uh, you know we can see the demand is there. So so it's about uh, scaling to meet the demand. Uh, I would say more than more than any other uh, tactics, uh, so to say. And as Carson just mentioned, we have the capacity to scale and accelerate, you know, serving many more patients in the second half. And I think that's I think the encouraging part of our release here that we upgrade uh, to to do that against a somewhat tougher comparator in the second half of the year. So I think that's a sign of a strong strong momentum and and also execution from a supply chain point of view. Thank you. Uh, last question for such a clarification then. Where are you with Medicaid penetration? Should we expect a major t uptick in 2H relative to 1H? So I, I don't have detailed uh, insight into that, and I'm not sure we can comment specifically on that. So, okay. so if I can uh, just give, give uh, one data point. So, so we have Medicaid coverage to, into the tune of, uh, of 20 states. How exactly the volumes are going to fall out in, in, in the second half between Medicaid and, and commercial, uh, of course, is, is, is very speculative. But, uh, but we have actually a very strong uh, Medicaid-based access uh, of 20 states and, and around 10, 10 million people with obesity covered that way around. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Carsten. And thank you, Sachin. And with that, we are ready for the next set of questions, please. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Foster, J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, maybe one on Wagovi in the U.S. Uh, as well. You know, based on the new patient, I know you've said that your 35,000 uh, scripts a week, you'll limit those starter doses. But based on the new patients you've already accrued and that level of patients and your knowledge of the pull through of patients to higher doses, how, how do you see the TRX developing? You've obviously doubled in the first half, but some idea of how that could develop, I think, would be helpful to people. Uh, and I suppose the question is, at what point do you expect TRX to ex exceed scripts from Ozempic on a weekly basis? And then one other question just on Ozempic XUS supply. Um, I think you alluded to that that could improve in the second half, but just when can you in, uh, anticipate supply being resolved there so that we can expect uh, strong growth in the second half. Uh, when can we expect strong growth for, for Zempic to res re re resume uh, in IO? Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. On the first one in terms of the strong TRX trends in the US, I'll hand it over to you, Doug. 
Yep, thank you, Richard. And let me just clarify, we're not precisely limiting to 35. We're dynamically managing that because, again, critically important to us is patient continuity of care. So that is the starting dose, as you know, and so that's the one we will manage. It's not to limit, and so you may see fluctuations with that. Um, what I would anticipate is a steady, consistent TRX trend. Um, I don't want to get into where that may go or where that may cross Ozempic. Again, we're pleased with the performance. As Karsten and both Lars alluded to, we've more than doubled that from the beginning of the year to currently. Uh, we're seeing strong MBRX, and, and we're serving more patients. So I don't want to get into predictions of when they'll cross. Thank you, Doc. And on the gradual supply scaling, over to you, Karsten. Yeah, so uh, so talking about uh, uh, XUS X and, uh, and 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 scaling there, then uh, first of all I would just like to allude to to the performance in uh, international operations where where Rebelsus, our all semaglutide is uh, is doing uh, really well in in the first half, growing sixty-six uh, percent. So so actually contributing as much as as Ozempic, uh, in in international operations. And then looking at, at, at I/O between the first half and, and second half, then, uh, the, then, then clearly our, our ambition and what's implied in, in guidance is an acceleration from the 11% we, we delivered in, in, in the first half, and that uh, that acceleration uh, will, will come from uh, from the Stemma franchise. Uh, but as you see, we we have now launched in in 12 markets with uh, with Wigovi in international operations. So 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 clearly, you should also expect to to see some some pick up there, driving uh, higher sales growth in the second half uh, in I/O. Thank you, Carsten, and thank you, Richard, for those two questions. We are now ready to take the next set of questions, please. Thank you. Your next questions come from Peter Fedolt from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Peter Fedolt, City. Um, two questions, Doug. Just some, the obligatory. Um, any latest data or intel in terms of average duration of use uh, on WeGovi? And then, secondly, um, Carsten on the 340B. When we last spoke, um, my understanding was Novo has been very conservative in revenue recognition from 340B leaving risks very much to the upside. And I think when we last discussed this, and I wrote on this, you know, the, should the rulings go your way, there be, could be quite a material um, uplift to earnings, I think, to the tune of 5%. So can I just uh, just check in with you whether that is still um, the case, or have you any updated thoughts there? Thank you. Thank you, Pete. On the first one on, on Vigovi State Time, uh, I'll give that to you, Doc. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. For the question, so in the U.S., we're still seeing around six months, and that's, you know, given the periodic supply constraints, and we have to work through that. But I would tell you this. We are confident that over time, the stay time will improve more towards 12 months and beyond, which would reflect the clinical profile of the product and what we saw in some of the clinical trials. So um, still around six months. We're working through that. Uh, more to come as we see more stability in supply over time. Thank you, Doug. And over to Carsten on 340B. Yeah, th thanks, Pete, for, for, for that comment. And, uh, and, and first of all, uh, I'd just like to, to refer also to our company announcement and, and the update on 340B that, that, that we included on, on the legal, legal matters there. And I would say the, the only new item com compared to when we discussed in connection with, the, with Q1 is that, that there's uh, one additional ruling that has come out in, in, in this case complex which is a DC circuit ruling, which uh, which ruled uh, similarly to to the ruling uh, we we had uh, uh, in in our case. So so all supporting our case, but uh, but but we still have one key ruling outstanding in in the seventh circuit, and uh, and then as as to our our accounting. Um, I, I don't uh, remember us uh, discussing it being conservative. I remember us discussing it be, being prudent and aligned to, to the accounting standards of, uh, of, of revenue recognition, where revenue recognition has to be highly probable uh, in order to, to, to book it as, as revenue. So, so that's, uh, that's how we do it. And, uh, but we also call out that, that there is a scenario where that, that could have a material impact on our financial position, 
and and that's what we call out in our announcement. And then uh, let's see how, how the Seventh Circuit uh, rules and uh, and uh, what level of appeals uh, we'll be looking at in in the coming months. It, it could be could be any day there that could be news, but uh, I don't know anything further as of today. Thank you. Thank you, Carsten, and thank you, Pete, as well. We're now ready to take the next question, please. Thank you. Your next questions come from James Quigley from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I've got two, please. So firstly, on um, some of the obesity portfolio considerations, you've got a number of obesity readouts in the second half of the year. Um, but how are you thinking of the relative positioning um, and weight loss expectations for step up? So the 7.2 milligram SEMA and obviously Cagri SEMA then as well. Will it be an either or approach for them from a commercial perspective or will it be de purely data dependent? Um, and could SEMA 7.2 milligram potentially be more desirable given the known CV benefits from SEMA uh, across all the trials we've seen and, and we haven't necessarily seen that with Cagri yet? Um, and then a uh, second question on oral uh, therapy. So obviously there's been some competitive data, that's, some early competitive data that's been out on the market uh, recently. But in terms of your oral offerings, so Oasis 4, um, how, how would you characterize the, the competitiveness of the data you've seen so far for the 25 milligram dose? And how are you thinking about positioning in the market uh, or even a market fit, a, fit approach on, um, uh, on the launch? Um, and then maybe also related to that on the oral snack technology, can you remind us where you are in terms of the latest generations um, and to, at what point you'll be able to have a, a peptide-based oral with, with the snack technology that could be as convenient as a, uh, as a, as a um, uh, typical small molecule? Thank you. Thank you, James. I think I counted a little bit more than two questions there, but first over to Camilla on the overall obesity portfolio, and after that we'll turn to Martin on the, on the snack enhancer. Yeah, thanks a lot. First of all, I'd just like to say that we are uh, very uh, encouraged about the progression of our pipeline in obesity, and of course we look forward to the readouts that we are having in the second half of this year. It's going to be an exciting second, second half from a number of phase three readouts that we have, and uh, both in the oil and also in the injectable space. And I think uh, let's await those uh, readouts, and then later on, of course, when we get closer to launches, we can talk about uh, positioning and how we are going to commercially, you know, utilize uh, the strong pipeline that we have. Thanks a lot, Camilla. And over to you, Martin, on Snack. Yeah, so specifically in the clinical space, we've been testing, obviously, generation 1, 2, and 3, as, 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 as you know. And um, in the research space, we continue to, to evolve this. goes without saying, we'll not take any new generation into the clinic un unless we see a potential for step change in, in terms of, 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 of bioavailability. And this is an ongoing journey and an ongoing effort for us. Um, with respect to 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 to, to the uh, sort of dosing uh, restrictions, we actually don't see them as as limitations. Uh, but but I also have to say we, we we don't see a potential of removing those limitations uh, anytime soon. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. And just a reminder in the company announcement, James, you will also see the uh, the approval in EMA of the. Uh, of, of, of the new doses related to all tobacco-type slash rebels um, in, 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 in the EU. Thanks a lot, Martin, and thanks a lot, uh, James. We are now ready for the next set of questions. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Emmanuel Papadakis from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking the question. Maybe a question on SEMA ahead of central inclusion in 2027 IRA price negotiation. Perhaps you could just enlighten us as to what magnitude of price cut you've assumed in your midterm planning and your latest perspectives on potential uh, impact in the commercial channel from reduced pricing in Medicare. And then on CAGRI SEMA ahead of the first redefined results, just talk to us a little bit about your device capacity for the dual chamber pen device at launch. Would that be enough to switch a significant proportion of patients from SEMA to CAGRI SEMA over that 2026-27 time frame, or indeed, is there any reason why you wouldn't expect the majority of patients to start switching over? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. The first one on the IRA and the latest there, uh, that goes to, to you, Doc. Yep, thanks, Emmanuel, for the question. Maybe as a starting point, I'd like to say that, you know, we, we, we fundamentally disagree with the principles of price setting. It hurts innovation, 
It potentially creates higher out-of-pocket costs for seniors and, and less choice. So that's not good. Um, what I would say is, is that we're not going to comment on price, but you know, we, we've, we've worked through the first negotiations on Novolog and FIASP. And as you know, that's a minor part of our business, so we expect uh, limited impact there. And then I would say as it relates to a read through to semaglutide, it's just way too early. This has been a new process for both us and the government. We're learning a lot. I'm sure they learned a lot, uh, but I don't want to speculate on what that may mean for a semaglutide read through. Thank you, Doc. And for the second question on Kagasema capacity, over to you, Carsten. Yeah, uh, hi Manuel. Thank you for the question. Um, for Kekrusema and, uh, and 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 supply chain strategy, then uh, then of course we we learned uh, we learned a lot from uh, from Vigovi and uh, and and we are full speed in terms of of scaling our capacities uh, linked link to Kekrusema. It is a dual chamber device, so uh, so scalability is different compared to multi use uh, devices uh, that uh, that we have in in other parts of of our portfolio. But, uh, but we are rapidly scaling the Kegrusema device. We are exploring a co-formulation also to, to Im improve scalability. Uh, it's not without risk, and that's why I say it, uh, we're exploring the opportunity um, uh, to, to do so. And, and then bear in mind, uh, behind Kegrusema in our pipeline, we, we have uh, uh, amicretin in a, in a subcutaneous version. Uh, which will report out uh, in, in the first quarter of next year, which is another offering together with the, with, with the step up. And then I'll, as my last comment, I would say, given the clinical profile of, of semaglutide, uh, we believe that, uh, that we will be selling semaglutide for, for many, many years to come, and, and we are building the infrastructure to, to compete on that at a global scale for, for many years to come. Thank you, Carsten, and also thanks for the questions. With that, we are ready for the next set of questions, please. Thank you. Your next questions come from the line of Simon Baker, Redburn Atlantic. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my questions too, if I may. Um, firstly, uh, going back to the obesity pipeline, um, you announced that you terminated the development of the uh, once monthly uh, injectable GLIP GIP due to portfolio considerations. I wonder if you could elaborate on that and also update us on your, your appetite um, for a monthly injectable uh, obesity treatment. Um, and then a question on ICODEC in the US. Um, given the um, complete response letter and leaving aside the questions on manufacturing, is um, a type one uh, carve out from the uh, application a possible solution to expediting this because I assume that one mustn't just think about ICADEC but also ICASEMA which is potentially the bigger opportunity and obviously held up by this. Any thoughts on that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you Simon. Both of those go to, to you Martin. Firstly on the once monthly GLP-1 GIP and secondly on, on ICODEC. Yep. Uh, absolutely. So, so uh, I just want to iterate. I think we all, all along, uh, stated that that the, the once monthly uh, GLP-1 uh, GIP study that we conducted uh, was an exploratory study, uh, more assessing the concept of of, of a, a once monthly technology that, that, than the actual uh, GLP-1 GIP component. Uh, it was exploratory, and 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 while we we, we definitely can use the data. The current profile was not something that we would take for into further clinical development. So, so basically, we still have this focus. We do see once monthly as as convenience uh, more than anything else. Our primary focus is efficacy and safety, and as we already discussed, there we have a very competitive uh, pipeline and portfolio. But we will maintain this focus uh, with 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 with. Uh, either next generation of this technology or, or, or uh, alternative technologies. Um, specifically on, on uh, ICODEC, um, we are in ongoing uh, dialogue with the FDA, so I don't want, want, want to speculate too much, uh, but obviously part of this is a potential carve out of the type 1 diabetes. You should not see this impact the, the ICOSEMA dialogue. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, and also thank you, Simon, for, for those two questions. Then we have uh, time for one final set of questions, please. Thank you. 
Your final questions come from the line of Mark Purcell from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for taking my questions. Mugovi heart failure, could you help us understand the additional data you're looking to file uh, and whether you're going for uh, a CV death and heart failure um, endpoints, sort of hard endpoints in terms of a claim from the studies? I, I guess, you know, the pooled analysis of uh, the Step HF programs showed a strong 69% risk reduction in CV death and heart failure events, but there's significant um, uh, numbers of patients in, in select and flow, which I guess could be relevant. So a, an understanding of what you're aiming to achieve there would be great. Thank you. Uh, and then the second one, just as a follow-up to uh, INV202, could you help us understand, Martin, how INV347 differs compared to IV, INV202 in terms of PK and CNS distribution and, and selectivity to CB1 versus CB2 receptors, just trying to understand whether this could actually re, uh, leapfrog uh, melanoband uh, into, into phase three. Thank you, Mark, and both of those to, to, to you, Martin. Firstly, semaglutide in, in HFPEF, and secondly, uh, within Invasago, the INV347. Uh, four, uh, four yeah, thank you very mu mu much, Mark, for those questions. Uh, first of, of all, on HFPEF, as you recall, we, we conducted two dedicated uh, HFPEF trials in patients with established uh, HFPEF, one in uh, diabetes and one in patients uh, without diabetes but with obesity. Uh, when we do the meta-analysis of the two trials, we see a 69% decrease in risk of CV death or hospitalization for heart failure, so absolutely very strong data and something that, that has encouraged us a lot. This was also why uh, the FDA granted us breakthrough destination. As we discussed last quarter, we had fairly few events in the, these two reasonably small studies, and, and do, through our dialogue with the FDA, it was very clear that if we could sort of increase the volume of, of events to further substantiate this, the likelihood of getting heart endpoints into to, to, to the U.S. label would, would increase. Given that we have some, some strong, uh, have had and will have some strong readouts in the not so distant future, it was, it was a reasonably easy decision to, to, to say we, 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 can, we, we can accept a small delay um, and, and then increase our likelihood of getting uh, hard endpoints into the label as compared to, to, to the more functional test. Uh, so, so we saw that as, as a really good bargain. Um, on on one lunar band, um, second generation, it's still early days. Uh, there is a potential for a longer half-life, uh, so, so a potential for less frequent than once daily dosing, which is obviously attractive. And further, a, 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 a potential for, for even less uh, brain penetration. Again, we are quite confident with the safety profile of, of Monluna band, but again, if second generation could have an, 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 an even lower likelihood of potential uh, adverse events, that would be attractive. I don't think you will see um, anything surpass our progress of Monluna band. We see this as, as a really, really strong life cycle management opportunity. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to everyone else who have asked questions during the session. This concludes the Q&A session. Thanks a lot for participating and feel free to contact Investor Relations regarding any follow-up questions you might have. Before we close the call, I'd like to hand it over to you, Lars, for any final remarks. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, I hope it comes across that we are very pleased with the momentum in our business, in particular our GLP-1 business in diabetes and obesity, and not least uh, the strong growth for the GOVI uh, script trends in the US, which is really fueling the upgrade we have communicated today. Uh, which also means that our supply is on track uh, in being able to serve many more patients, uh, both short and, and longer term. Uh, we're also excited about our pipeline, uh, news we have announced uh, recently, uh, but also what we have coming up uh, later in the year. So that, thank you also from my side for your questions and attention today. With that, we close the call. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.